But to kick us all off uh, in this set, in this particular slot, we have um, Professor Greg Marsden. Uh, for those who don't already know uh, Greg, he is the Professor of Transport Governance at the University of Leeds. But actually for today, for the next 20 minutes or next 25 minutes, he is going to be uh, the Secretary of State for Sustainable Commuting. Uh, it is uh, our honour, Secretary, for you to give us uh, your, your position in terms of what is needed if we were to have this wonderful department. Greg, over to you. Thanks a lot, Graham. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Mobility Ways uh, for inviting me to talk to you uh, all this morning. Um, before I do uh, move into my role as the Right Honourable Hugh R. Joking, uh, I thought I'd explain why I've decided to give this talk as the Secretary of State for the Imaginary Department for Sustainable Commuting. Um, there's something wrong with how we make transport policy. Uh, as the past month has shown, when push comes to shove, transport policy uh, is about who gets what funding for what transport scheme, where in the country. Um, so we might all subscribe to the idea that travel is a derived demand, that we only travel because we want to go somewhere to do something. We even collect lots of statistics to that effect through the National Travel Survey. However, what we decide to do in transport policy, and overall I suggest how we assess what to do, seems to me to far too often marginalise this fundamental insight. So um, let's place you in my uh, thought experiment. And I apologise for the lack of union jack flags and uh, NAF three word kind of uh, template in front of me. Um, but I want to imagine that we no longer have a department for transport. This has been uh, dissolved. Maybe this is one of Tim's radical solutions. Uh, and we've instead got a department for sustainable commuting, a department for st sustainable tourism, etc. And somewhere underneath there is an executive agency which is tasked with building the things which help fulfil the goals of these other departments. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I set out the plan today for the first 100 days of the Department for Sustainable Commuting. No more empty promises. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we hold at the front of our mind here at the DFSC is that commuting matters. It matters to people, it matters to businesses, it matters to the economy, and it matters to the planet. And I asked my lead advisor, Sir Ali of Claiborne, uh, for some headline statistics on the cost of the commute. It's estimated that eight billion pounds is lost to the economy every year in congestion, most of which is concentrated in the morning and evening peaks as a result of the commute. But I was also surprised to find out that each year employees spend around £25 billion on commuting with fares, fees, fuel and vehicle costs. Almost 10% of families own a car just to participate in the labour market. We know this because they own a car even though they can't afford a single week of holiday during the year. And that was before the cost of living crisis kicked in. Accessing work is a major social cost to all parts of society, as well as being something fundamental for our way of life. But not only is it a major social cost, but the commute costs businesses. It costs them directly in terms of providing parking spaces, the land for cars to sit on, lighting, the security to look after them, etc. And it costs them because poor commutes lead to poor productivity and to loss of staff and all of the additional recruitment costs that go with that. Estimated to be around the same cost uh, as um, that to commuters themselves. So providing for the commute in the way that we do and the way that we have been doing seems to me to place an unnecessary burden on people and on businesses. So why do we tolerate this? Next slide. So I asked my officials what the direction of travel was here. Excuse the transport pun. The Department of Transport had been looking at this for years. Surely there were some approaches that we should build on. Well, I was shocked. Since 2015, speeds across the network 
have got slower by an average of around 4%. This is even worse in the peak hours. I looked at the national road traffic projections from late 2022. And in some scenarios, this is forecast to get 30% worse by 2030 and staggeringly up to 70% worse by 2050. So it seems that we're anticipating more traffic, which is seen to be by some a marker of economic progress. Yet the very thing which is supposed to be indicative of a strong economy looks certain to make things worse for businesses. But these are just projections, so there must have been a plan to sort this out, right? Next slide. And there was. The problem is that it's the same plan that's been in place since the 1980s, and it's not worked. I was reminded of Prime Minister Cameron's announcement that the Conservatives would instigate the biggest road building programme since the 1970s. Or was it the Victorians? Or was it the Romans? I can't remember now. Money was ring fenced in the budget for a roads investment strategy. So what's been achieved? We've managed to build 8.6 miles of motorway a year and 30.6 miles of A roads. That sounds rather small, doesn't it? Well, in fact, it's less than half of 1% of the network every year and even less than that for non motorways. How could such a glacial pace of road building possibly be the answer to anything? And let us be clear, there's no route forward where I, as Secretary of State for Sustainable Commuting, could advocate going faster on this. We have climate obligations and we would spend more of our money in court than we would on road building. There's also no public appetite for a large scale roads programme. And even if you thought all of that were unimportant or could somehow be surmounted, it will not work. It was understood in the early 1990s that we cannot predict traffic growth and try and provide for it with roads and actually reduce congestion. There is no strategy that would deliver that. So why has this been forgotten? Well, partly I would suggest it's because we had a department which was focused on accessing money for infrastructure rather than considering as proactively as it should do the role that that infrastructure plays in our economy and our daily lives. We must all acknowledge that we're entering a very difficult period of fiscal reckoning following the pandemic and the previous financial crisis. The debt to GDP ratio is higher in this country than at any time since the post-war debt was paid down. Interest rates for public sector borrowing are at historic highs and the length of time over which we've got agreements on borrowing funds are at the shortest they have been in history, which means we're paying more for our government debt. Public sector spending will not be expanding, at least not on the things we want to spend it on. And where the government can make a case for greater investment, it will rightly be spent in rebuilding schools and expanding hospitals and not wasting it on strategies which do not work. Next slide. But I thought, hang on, there must be some good news. We have smart motorways now. I know because I've been caught in their construction for what seems like forever. But then I found out that we don't have smart motorways. I was informed that the average car occupancy in the morning peak is just 1.1 and that it's fallen 5% in the past 20 years. So we've spent all that money expanding our roads by an incremental amount in order to put more bits of metal along the road, not as it turns out, more people. It's not, I suggest, that there's a need for more road capacity to deliver a better commute but a different attitude to the precious road space that we have. 120 billion empty seat miles are driven every year in the commute just by lone drivers. And there are many more spaces in other cars too. There must be better ways of using this capacity. Now, some people advocate road user charging as a silver bullet to cut congestion. We will, I'm sure, move to a pay per mile system as we switch over to electric vehicles so that we can replace the, the fuel duty, uh, which currently is paid by fossil fuel cars. However, we will not be moving to a pay per minute and by time of day system anytime soon. 
the pandemic showed that 50% of people cannot work from home at all, whereas 50% of people can. If we charge for driving in the peak, then this will cause gross unfairness, and that's not what the DFSC is after. So, what are we proposing? Next slide. Well, the first thing we're proposing is a rethink of approach. This guy knew a thing or two, and so we'll not be going back to the biggest roads programme since the Romans narrative, which doesn't work. More seriously, and jumping out of character for a, a second, we need to undermine the claim that somehow infrastructure expansion is the answer. This is something which infects all political parties, and I commend the Welsh Government for their pragmatic approach to thinking through when infrastructure expansion can be justified in a climate emergency. Anyway, back to the script. Next slide. Our plan puts the needs of businesses and workers together with our goals for the economy, social equity and the carrying capacity of the planet right at the heart of what we do. And if you think this is a horrible depiction and a NAF icon, I invite you to look at the plan for drivers from the dying days of the Department for Transport. I think that's far worse. Next slide. So what are the pragmatic policies that we can do in our first 100 days? Now, obviously, all of these proposals are fully costed and you can find the details in the back of our manifesto. Um, but seriously, infrastructure spend relies on a rebalancing of funds which have previously been dedicated to road expansion. So instead, we'll be focusing on road utilisation. First, national highways will be given a network efficiency duty, which requires them to drive up the number of people which can be moved around the network during peak hours, rather than the number of vehicles. This will mean starting with the basics of simply counting such matters so that we can track performance. We don't even do that during our morning and evening peak. There is huge potential to join up journeys along busy stretches of our motorways and major roads. We are, of course, a many point to many point society and aggregating demand can be difficult. However, we've built some natural funnels known as roads, which bring that demand together. We now need to unleash the opportunities to share that resource. We've reallocated funding from road expansion to the construction of a network of parkway style park and ride sites, which will enable car sharing and express coach services to serve key markets. They'll also open up new vehicle charging opportunities and where they can act as integrated mobility hubs. We'll give all local authorities a fund for infrastructure which supports the move to shared transport. This will include better provision at and en route to our new hub network, at other public transport interchanges, and to massively expand the mobility hub ambitions they have. We need a system which says, use the right mix of modes for your journey, rather than the old car versus public transport divide, which is rather tired and doesn't work. To that end, we'll also set some new standards to ensure things like e-scooters and other forms of personal light electric mobility are safe and can be stored on public transport. We want people to be multimodal. We will provide revenue support for new DRT services, which are backed by businesses and local authorities to address areas where the public transport network does not work for the local labour market needs. Next slide. We, the public sector, will lead on this agenda. Governments, the NHS, universities are some of the biggest employers in our towns and cities. On average, across the economy, we represent around 18% of the workforce, and in some areas that can be as high as 30%. There will be a requirement to improve the commute experience and reduce the cost of the commute to the economy and the public purse through the public sector. Businesses want to do more, but they're not all specialists at travel planning. We'll fund a programme of workplace travel plan coordinators. Remember those folks from the 1990s? We'll also support services which can, can support businesses. This will harness hundreds of millions of pounds which businesses will spend on their own transitions to net zero. But we'll use this as an opportunity to join it up for better and better value for money outcomes. 
This is critical because, as I said earlier, you cannot expect the public purse alone to fund the transition at the pace we need. Partnership matters and is to be embraced. We'll see, we, we will see real innovation with locally targeted solutions that help improve the environment, working environment for firms and individuals. And on this note, rather than counting the cost of the time spent on the journey to work as somehow a measure of the importance of the commute, we must understand how commuting impacts on productivity and the wider quality of life of workers. We'll establish major trials which explore how different commuting uh, approaches impact these key factors, including the balance between work in the office and working remotely. It's almost impossible to believe that, given the seismic shift in working practices during and after the pandemic, that we've had no strategic direction as to how the return to work should best be managed in the joint interests of businesses, transport providers, congestion and the environment. And finally, we look over to the channel to the amazing work being done by the French government to drive up car sharing. There's no need to be ashamed of this. In particular, they're incentivizing people to start using car sharing platforms. There are lots of small innovations out there that could make a difference. Next slide. Finally, on policy measures, if we want a new system, then we have to change the old tax rules and incentives that have helped make the old system so durable. We'll not increase business rates, but instead ring fence a proportion of recent increases to support commuting measures in line with the productivity gains we can expect in return for business. We'll stop the ludicrous perk, which hides in plain sight, of free parking provision at work. If you have a single occupancy parking place, then this will be a taxable benefit from late 2025. Every penny reinvested in supporting a better commute. We'll phase out the business in kind support for zero emission vehicles from 2027 as the cost of buying a new electric car falls closer to its fossil fuel equivalents. We have to stop subsidising the thing that we're telling people that we want them to do less of. We'll also address complexities over how pool cars and car sharing are treated in the tax regime. So it enables new and innovative models to emerge, which support greater sharing during the commute. Next slide. So my message to you today is simple. We cannot go on as we were. It's a failed model and it needs calling out as such. I believe there's a better way. This means looking at the commute as a key activity in the economy and a key social issue. What I've set out today is the plan for commuters. It's also the plan for businesses. It's a plan for the economy. Given how fundamental this is to how we work. And finally, it's a plan for the planet. We have to do more with less and we have to start the task today and with urgency. So thanks for listening. I'm now going to be shuffled away by my private secretary for a photo shoot. Uh, and I think at some point I'm going to re-emerge for a panel discussion. So thanks a lot, Graham. Superb.